Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday, and welcome to Great Commission Community Church. Um, it is so good to see all of you this morning, um, fellowshipping. Um, but, um, beloved, as we gather here together this morning, we are reminded that we all can enter into his courts with praise. Jesus' blood has washed us anew, has made us holy, and has made us right with God. So in humility, we cast off all attempts to justify our beliefs that we deserve or don't deserve to be with God. We enter into God's presence through his free, unmerited gift of grace. Our call to worship this morning comes from the writer of Hebrews. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. As you are able, um, please stand with us at this time as we sing. Today, and we won't be quiet. 
your throne from desert to the sea all nature testifies your splendor praise the lord praise the lord sing his greatness all creation praise the lord raise your voice you high to know you thanks from furthest east to west let everything that has bread praise the lord in your very likeness to know your wondrous works to tell your mighty deeds to join the everlasting chorus praise the Lord praise the Lord sing his greatness all create to the king a roar of harmony eternal praise the lord praise the lord sing his greatness all creation praise the lord raise your voice you high to know you lips from further Please turn to someone, welcome each other, and proclaim to one another the peace of Christ to you. Welcome to our Sunday service. Uh, my name is Chris, uh, one of the staff members here at our church. Uh, just a very important announcement for the next three Sundays. We will not be here at the Double Tree. We'll be meeting at the Crown Plaza, just right around the corner. So Google Crown Plaza Crystal City. All right, so for the next three Sundays, Crown Plaza Crystal City. 
Uh, and you'll, you'll see it on our website too, but if, if you're just like muscle memory and you're just like driving or you're like metroing in, remember, or something where we're praying that the Holy Spirit would like remind you at that moment, <laughs> Crown Plaza, Crystal City. Uh, this Saturday, we have a membership interest class, uh, and so it'll be from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, this is a great opportunity to, uh, if you're interested in being, in being a member or just interested about our church. And so this is a great way uh, for you to just to see, like, oh, is this the community that, that God, dis- is this the local church that God has called me to? Is this the one that he's called me to invest in? But in turn, that this community would invest in you. Uh, and uh, a key thing about hey, why I become a member uh, is that you, you get a say into what our, our church does in terms of where, where our, our money goes, like as tithing comes in, how we want to use it for God's kingdom. And so you, you, you get a voice in, hey, like where do we think like God is moving? Where do we think like the direction and finances, and so we highly recommend you come this Saturday. I'm going to be there because uh, this this class is offered once a year, and we just moved here in September, so I I haven't gone to a, a membership class yet. And um, Pastor Steve was like, "Yeah, you should you should come." And so I'll I'll, I'll be there at the class too. A women's retreat. Uh, we're excited to announce that the registration for early bird is is now open. And so we're going to have early bird registration until February 29th. Uh, and so it's going to be a, a good, nice discounted rate a, until then. Uh, the dates for it are May 3rd through 5th. So it's going to be a Friday evening through Sunday morning. Uh, it's going to be at a beautiful location called Sandy Cove uh, in Maryland. Uh, the speaker, oh, we're excited, is going to be Reverend Jen Ashby, who is the director of church health in the Metropolitan District Uh and that's, that covers, like, New Jersey, uh, New York City, Philadelphia. Uh, and she's also on the board of our greater national or global uh, 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 Christian and Missionary Alliance. And so uh, really excited to have her. The theme is invitation to go deeper. So as Jesus invites us to pursue and grow deeper with him, we hope that this retreat will provide that kind of space in where you'll get to spend time with Jesus through worship, through prayer, through times of reflection, as well as times of fellowship with other sisters. And so you can find more details about it uh, on our website. And again, prices will increase after February 29th. So we encourage you, encourage you to sign up early. This uh, Tuesday, Darren and Lynn will actually be uh, in our um, weekly prayer meeting. Uh, and so uh, on Tuesdays, we pray together at 8 p.m. on Zoom. So uh, they'll be there, and that'll be an opportunity to, to pray with them, to pray over what God is doing, uh, and pray alongside of them. Uh, and so join us. Uh, you can find the, the link for that uh, on our website under cause. Uh, and then next, our, our partners, our international partners in Cambodia, uh, the ones that who we were able to help build that medical clinic, um, and, and those restrooms uh, in, in that hospital. Uh, they asked us uh, just this past week if we can come and help them uh, hold their annual retreat. And so that's going to be July 22nd through 30th. Uh, their original plans for that uh, fell through, uh, and so they're, they're asking if, if we would be able to come uh, and help them. And so specifically, they're looking for someone to te- teach kids, uh, someone to teach their youth, and finally someone to lead worship. Uh, and so if, if you're interested, um, if, yeah, if, if something comes up and stirs, please contact Pastor Jonathan. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have our head pastor, Pastor Steve, in the house today. And so please come and just say hi to him uh, after service is over. Or, yeah, say hi to him now, but also say hi to him uh, after. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, we, we, we are very warm and welcoming here. Um, uh, at this time, we're going to close our time with offering. We don't have a traditional offering box. We have all our giving options online. Uh, So I'll say a quick prayer uh, for our offering together. Uh, Lord, thank you for just the the things that we're hearing uh, of how you're using our church 
uh, not only the relationships we've had and the people we've uh, equipped and sent out, but even in terms of, of finances, how you've, you've, you've used us uh, to really build and impact your kingdom uh, in other places in the world. So God, I pray that as you continue to work in us, that God, that you would continue to grow our hearts for the world, for our neighbors, for our communities, for those who are in need. And God, we pray that you would use us to be your hands and your feet into the world. And so God, continue for your spirit to work in us. Come and be with us the rest of our service today. We praise you. We bless your name. God, Jesus name I pray. Amen. Today, this is our second to last Sunday, um, meditating on Paul's letter to the church in ancient Ephesus. Uh, in two Sundays, we're going to begin our Lent season when we focus on the death of Christ and our dying together with Christ, our old life uh, without him, that is, dying, and our new life with him alive. Uh, during Lent, we're going to be focusing um, in our sermons on, on Moses' Ten Commandments, and after that, during Easter season, um, so it's 40 days of Lent, and then after that, there's actually 50 days of Easter. Um, during Easter season, we're going to be focusing on Christ's resurrection and our resurrection with him as well, taking up our new life in Christ. Um, so during that time, we're going to be meditating on the Song of Songs. Um, and um, I just ask that you please uh, keep the church um, always in your prayer and also uh, for our pastors and in particular as we prepare um, these messages. You know, I'm starting to, like, study the Song of Songs, like, really in depth. And I'm like, how are we going to preach these? So um, please pray for us. <laughs> anyway, um, it's going to be awesome. Anyway, um, but today we're looking at Paul's exhortation to the church in the context of households and families. Um, some popular English translations of the Bible uh, start our section at 522, like there's like a little section break. But FYI, that's the middle of a sentence in Paul's original Greek. And the sentence actually starts in verse 18. So we'll pick it up there. But before we do, we're going to read a handful of verses starting from chapter 1, just to remind ourselves what Paul is writing about and what Paul is excited about in this letter. But before we read any of it, please pray with me again. again. God, we thank you for this new life in Christ that we have together. And we thank you for our life in Christ. We're thankful for the beauty and goodness and power and love that we experience in you, the safety, the security, the wonder, and the hope that we experience in you. We're thankful, we're thankful for the love, the height and depth and breadth of love uh, that we know and just aspire to know more and more together. Lord, like uh, you've told us in the word, um, Lord, we, we pray for your spirit's empowerment to know together in, in actual life, not just intellectually, but to li live and, and know together how high and wide and long and deep is the love of Christ. Lord, we are thankful to you this morning. Lord, fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so, like I said, we're going to start in actually chapter 1, um, but our actual passage starts in chapter 5. So I'm just going to read a few verses here. Um, we're just going to hop around in the first uh, four chapters of Ephesians. Uh, first, I'm going to read verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Uh, God made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. What is this mystery of his will? What is his purpose? to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, for everything to be united under Christ, in Christ. At the end of this chapter, chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, God put all things under the feet of Jesus and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church is his body connected to him. The church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We are the fullness of him who fills all in all. In all. Skipping to chapter 2, uh, just in about the middle, verse 14. Christ himself is our peace who has made both one, that is two types of people, into one, 
He has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility between these groups by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. So instead of two people, there's just one now in Christ. Verse 10, that he might reconcile us both. He might reconcile all people, all things to God and in one body through the cross and in the cross killing the hostility between us. Verse 22, the very end of chapter 2, in Christ you also are being built together, built together. You are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Uh, In chapter 3, we're going to read just a few here, verse 17 through 19. And um, actually, I just prayed along these lines that Christ, I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Dwell in your plural hearts through faith that you, plural, being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, like all of you together, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. This is us speaking the truth. Actually, let's go back to chapter 4, verse 4 through 6. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. In verse 16, you guys, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is ahead, into Christ, from whom the whole body, that is us together, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, each joint, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's all of us. That's all of us. And finally, verse 22 to 24 uh, in this same chapter, Ephesians 4. Remember, we're putting off our old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. To be renewed, we're renewed in the spirit of your mind to put on the new self created after the likeness of God, in the image of God, in true righteousness and holiness. And this is where we find ourselves. Paul is talking about an old life versus a new life. An old life versus a new life. And as we unpack that, he says, put off these things. Take off these things. Take off stealing. Put off uh, unforgiveness and bitterness. And put on patience. Put on love. Put on good work with which you can share with other people. And here we come to verse 18, which is the beginning of our passage for today. Verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. By the way, this is a reference, I think, to every other association or club or group that they're a part of in this Roman Empire's culture. Basically, every group that you're a part of, like a work association, like a a meeting, like a poetry club, I don't know, whatever it is, a sports team, um, you know, your like adult soccer league, whatever it is. Every time you get together in the Roman Empire, every time they get together, they have a meal and they drink a lot. And the focus is on like just a lot of wine. That's what you do. And Paul's saying, our meetings are different. You know, Paul's saying, our meetings are different. When we get together, it's not about the flowing wine. It's about the flowing spirit. Okay, that's what we're talking about in uh, chapter 5, verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. Verse 19, what does it look like to be filled with the Spirit? What does it look like to be focused on the flowing Holy Spirit? What happens when the Spirit is flowing? Verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, amen? Aren't we thankful when we come together? I know I'm so thankful. Like when we sing, I'm so just grateful. It's just so good uh, to be like this together in this life. Verse 21, submitting to one another. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is what we do in our community. We submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then in verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Actually, in the, uh, again, in the original Greek, in the best Greek manuscripts that we have, the word submit isn't included in verse 22. It's verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to your husband, and so on. Okay? 
because it's just assumed it's part of the same thought, same sentence. Um, I understand why a lot of our tra English translations put a break there because it's sort of like a, a new topic and you, it's the awkwardness of like, how do you kind of show that it's a new topic but one sentence? Um, so that's what they do. But unfortunately, what's lost in there is like, wait, we're still talking about a life together. We're still talking about putting on a new life in Christ. We're still talking about submitting, everyone submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So wives, in the same way, Submit to your own husband. So wives, to your husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is ahead of the wife, even as Christ is ahead of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as a church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Just real quick, sorry. Earlier in chapter 5, just to make sure we're, we're kind of in the right ballpark here as we look at this passage, verse 2 of chapter 5, he's telling all the church, all of us, be imitators of God, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That is, all of you love each other sacrificially, just like Christ did. Yeah, amen? That's all of us. And then here we go in verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Does that mean husbands are the, like, the role of a husband is to love sacrificially and only husbands? No, not at all. We're all called to love each other sacrificially. But as he's talking about what life, what new life in the Lord looks like in a household setting, he says, we're all supposed to submit to one another. It's not just wives. All of us submit to one another. Are wives supposed to love sacrificially their husbands? Yes. Are husbands supposed to submit to their wives out of reverence for Christ? Yes. That's the context, okay? So let's keep that in mind. Verse 25 again. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. I mean, I know Paul's talking about husbands and wives here, but you can tell he's starting to just, he's getting excited about his vision for the church. He's getting excited about our unity in Christ. He's excited about our oneness with Christ. Verse 28, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own body or his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ as a church, because we are members of his body. Verse 31, therefore, and he's quoting from Genesis, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's talking about husbands and wives, but, verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. Like, Paul, are you talking about, are, are you saying Genesis 2 is about a husband and a wife, or are you saying that it's about Christ in the church? He's sort of like both, but he's like, he wants us to make sure he knows, we know what he's talking about. He says, I am talking about Christ in the church. That's what Genesis 2 is about. It's about Christ in the church. Verse 33, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Chapter 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is a quotation of one of those Ten Commandments of Moses. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Another word that's sometimes used in English translations, do not exasperate or frustrate your children, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Verse 5, bond servants or slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. This, by the way, slaves, is a, they were a big part of that time, of that economy, of that culture. Um, in the Roman Empire, I think scholars will estimate anywhere from like 10 to 30 percent of the population were slaves. Okay, so it's not just like this, oh, I know a slave here and there. Like slaves are everywhere. And I think if you can think, if we think like 10 to 30 percent of the population were slaves, same in the church. I mean, you can guess like what percentage of the church were slaves. But I mean, I would, I think a fair guess is to say it's similar. Um, just, just remember that, like, when Paul is writing this, uh, just another thing, as Paul's writing this, and he's expecting this to be read. So it's different from our time today where, like, each of us has a copy of the book of Ephesians. 
of the letter of Ephesians. Like, I can study it on my own. Like, I each, we each have our own copy, and it's mostly me just by myself, like, in a, in a Panera bread shop or something, or in my room alone, like, focus on this, you know, like, drinking my free sip club coffee, you know? It's, it's actually us together. Back then, there's just, like, one copy for a bunch of people, and they read it together when they get together. And so, and it's, when they read it together, everyone's there. So kids are there. You know, so when he says children, dude, it's because children are there. When he says slaves, slaves are there. And it could be like 10, 30% of the congregation are slaves, which is crazy. Okay, we'll talk about that more in a second, but it's crazy. All right, verse 5 again, chapter 6, verse 5. Bond servants are slaves. Obey your earthly lords or masters. Lords, that same word is like how, what we call Jesus, the Lord. That's the same word. So obey your earthly lords with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as slaves or bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service or your slavery, like being slaves or bond servants with a good will as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or is freed. Verse 9, masters or lords, do the same to them, to the slaves. Do the same thing to the slaves, to your slaves. Stop your threatening. Stop using threats, knowing that he who is both their Lord and yours is in heaven. You have the same Lord. You're all slaves, actually. And you have the same Lord. And then in verse 9 ends with um, actually a very stern note. Knowing that there is no partiality with him. Like he doesn't favor the owners. He doesn't favor the rich. That's our passage for today. Remember, this whole passage is, again, it's part of Paul's, like, kind of clothing or fashion theology for us. Putting on our new clothes, our new way of life in Christ, and getting rid of our old clothes, our old way of life. Our old clothes don't fit us anymore. Our old ways are out of fashion. They don't look good. They're, they're bad. We get rid of them. We don't say that. We get rid of them. They're not coming back in style in this case. Just get rid of them. Like Pastor Jonathan highlighted last week in terms of a sexual life, the new life that we wear now, like a new way of living out our sexuality, it fits us. It looks good. It feels good. And it's better. And same today goes for our household relationships. So um, Paul talks about three basic relationships, relationship between wife and husband, child and parent, and slave and lord. So we'll talk about each of these. So first, let's talk about wives and husbands. This is verse 22 to verse 33 in chapter 5. Actually, before we do, let me just start with this question um, that you might be asking. Is this relevant for people who are not married? Like, if you're not married, can we just tune out? So that's like 80% of us. Like, just like, I'm just going to check my messages and, you know, check on me in five minutes when we get through this part. Like, Paul was not married. Just let's, let's remember that. The writer of this letter, Paul, was not married. Never had kids. But what he's telling, is, telling us all is that we're all called to love one another. We're all called to submit to one another. We're all called to love sacrificially, giving that kind of love to each other. And seeing how wives and husbands live like this is a chance for all of us, whether we're married or not, to grow in living this life in Christ. Wives, Show us this new life in your marriage. Husbands, show us our love. You know, we're all doing this. This is the way we're all living it. So please, husbands, wives, you guys too, help us grow in it, married people. Help us out, married people. But this is for all of us. So for all of us to think, what does a life in Christ look like in our relationships? And so basically when we think about that, what does submission as to the Lord, for the Lord's sake, out of reverence for Christ? What is love that looks like Christ, just as Christ loved the church? What does submission and love to one another look like? Well, yeah, it looks like Jesus. It looks like how Jesus loved us. It looks like how we submit to Jesus, to the Lord, like the Lord, in the Lord. This is the, these are the phrases that Paul uses throughout this section. Paul, as he's explaining, he actually ends up saying, I'm actually talking about Christ in the church. He's excited. He's exhilarated by a vision of our life. 
a life together of such like radical and powerful unity. Like our incredible, it's like amazing. It's just jaw-dropping oneness with Christ and with one another. One body, even like one flesh, actually. One flesh. Like, do you really mean that we're one flesh with Christ, Paul? Like, that's what you're saying? This is like marriage, the most intimate relationship that we know of? Like, you're saying that's what we have with Christ? Yes. He actually says Genesis 2. That's, that's not even talking about a man or woman. That's talking about Christ and the church. That's what he says in this chapter. That's how one we are with Christ, and he's excited by that. We're one temple. We're one man made out of two. We're now one. We are one. We are one in love and in unity. There's one body, and we all belong to it. One temple, one flesh. This is what we do. As husband and wife, we treat each other like that. You know, like for myself, I want to be a good husband to my wife. Like, I want to be a good father to my kids, a good son to my parents, and, and so on. But more than that, I just want to live in Christ. That's what we're doing. I just want to live in Christ. And I want my parenting, I want my husbanding. I don't know if that's a word. Like, husbandry, I think, has to do with animals. So that's not right. But my being a husband, my being a child, I want it all to be part of my life in Christ, our life in Christ. I think that's why I think it makes sense for, for me to think, for us to think, like my wife, yeah, she's my wife, but ultimately she's just, she's my sister in Christ. My kids, like I'm a father to my son and my daughter, but to both of them, I'm just ultimately, in the end, I'm their brother in Christ. So the way we treat each other is unto the Lord, in the Lord, and like the Lord. You know, like a funny thing, when my wife and I got married, I wanted the wedding, I wanted our wedding to be a very clear illustration of Christ and the church. And I can be kind of kooky, um, like a little bit, I guess to put it nicely, like creative, in a not so nice way, just like kooky. Um, and I won't, into get, I won't get into detail on like what I was envisioning for our wedding ceremony, um, but I, wa- I wanted it to be a clear illustration of Christ and the church. I, don't, I was fresh out of seminary. I was like... T- like ready and we're gonna you know, I'm gonna, gonna teach through this service and um again I won't go into details but I'll mention one detail it involved pulleys like kind of coming on a like a pulley and like being like descending onto the ground so that gives you an idea of what I was thinking and what, why my wife said no <laughs> but in the end I think a better way to illustrate Christ in the church who Christ is to the church and who the church is to Christ, better than a 30-minute wedding ceremony, is a life together full of submission, full of self-sacrificing love. Show us what Christ and the church are like, married people. We want to know Christ. We want to know the depth and height and breadth and width of the love of Christ. So help us know. Show, married couple, show us. Husbands, wives, show us about this beautiful love in Christ. Show us about this mutual submission in Christ. Show us these things. I want to know. We want to know together. Let's do that. I mean, that's for all Christian married people, but that's for all of our Christian, all of us, all Christians in our life together. In our life together. You know, I would say, like, I remember a long time ago, um, this is not long, like maybe five years or so into um, our, my marriage, um, we've been married for like more than 20 years. Um, this is like, uh, like crazy. It just has flown by. And, uh, but, you know, by the way, like we saw that we were watching TV and we watched this concert on Austin City Limits. I don't know if you guys watch that show, but um, there is this couple on there. And uh, there's this Pat Benatar, who was like a rock singer of like the early 80s. And she and her husband, and they're like, co-workers too, like they're in the band together. They've been together for more than 40 years working together, but they've been married for like 42 years. And they're still like rocking too. (laughs) Like they still like give a great show. And I remember my wife and I, oh my gosh. Like sometimes I think, I've been married for 20 years. Like we're doing all right, you know? And then I'm like, oh man, we've just begun. Look at this. Look at this rocking couple. Anyway, but like, um, what was I saying? Husband husband and wives. Like we are uh, marriage... 20 years, I don't know, whatever. But, like, for real, what was I saying? 
Oh, yeah, thank you. Five years into our marriage, like, that's right. So we had friends. <laughs> so good. Uh, five years into our marriage, we had a really good friend, a non-Christian, and uh, he started becoming interested in knowing Christ. And he approached us. He's like, uh, yeah, could we, like, study the Bible together? And, you know, he knew I was a pastor, so that's one reason he asked us. But I think another, like, I think the more important reason outside of, like, that job that I had was he, he actually knew Chris, he and Chris worked together a lot. They were uh, sort of like, they were colleagues, more or less. And um, that's how we got to know him. And, um, you know, he had just gotten out of a relationship that had been around, you know, he had been in for a little while. He was starting a new relationship, a romantic relationship, I mean, and um, basically he trusted us because, you know, he just saw, and I, I, just, I just say it, like, very matter-of-factly, somehow he saw um, in us, like, something good, and he wanted to, like, understand Christ the way that we understood him. He knew that Christ was our motivation, um, our most important thing in life and in our marriage, and I mean, that's what marriage does, you know? It's not like we're trying to, like, hey, we got to show him. We got to be at our best when we're around him. It's, it's just this is what we do. Husbands, wives, show us love of Christ because we all want to know this love. We, always, we all want to know this mutual submission. We all want to know this self-sacrificing love. And Paul's telling wives and husbands, show us that. Yeah, amen? Husbands and wives, be inspired. Be inspired. Love like that. Um, all right, next section, children and parents, 6, 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verse 4 of chapter 6 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger or exasperate or frustrate your children, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Verse 4 is actually an odd contrast in there um, because they don't seem to be opposite things. He says, like, take off, sort of putting on, you know, thinking about that fashion theology, put off frustrating and vexing and um, provoking your children to anger. Put that away. That's your old life. Put on bringing your children up in the discipline and instruction, the education of the Lord, in the Lord. And so, I don't know, I, I feel like the idea of exasperating your children on one hand and then instructing them in Christ on the other, they're not necessarily contrast because I think you can still be an exasperating parent uh, trying to teach them the ways of the Lord. So, so, yeah, so it's sort of an odd contrast. But I think the main idea as we try to read Paul fairly is that just very simply exasperating and frustrating your children, that's part of an old life. Let's leave that behind. Okay? I mean, I, I think in some ways it's just part of parent and children relationships. It's just... I don't know if it's avoidable, but Paul is saying sort of, yeah, it is, you know. It's something that we don't have to have, and actually that's part of an old life outside of Christ. And actually in a new life, our focus is on growing up together in the Lord. That is, the relationship is changed in Christ because now we're not just parents and children. We're people growing together in the Lord. For youth, for those parents who have high schoolers, middle schoolers, I know traditionally, like culturally, those are like rebellious years, quote unquote. You know, and it makes sense because a child is kind of transitioning from like being a child to being an adult. And so, yeah, it's a messy transi transition often. But in Christ, we are growing together. We are growing together in the Lord. And our responsibility to our kids as parents is our primary responsibility, says Paul, is what we're putting on, the new clothes that fit right, are raising them to know the Lord. You know, just like with the rest of the church, like we all do for one another. Again, this is a command for all the church, but specifically children and parents. This is what it looks like. You know, I used to work with uh, children and families, like in a church setting, and in, especially in that time, I, I read and I, I attended seminars and etc. about parenting. I read a lot. I, I heard a lot. And actually, in my life, though, the best one, the best thing that I ever heard or ever attended was actually this non-Christian thing, and it was a non-church one, and it was put on by like a coaching alliance, and it was for like youth coaching. It was incredible. It was so good. 
and was, so much of it was so Christ-like. Um, but uh, I'll just mention this part because this is what chapter 6, verse 4 reminds me of. But, like, one of the things that they talked about was how they did a poll um, or some kind of survey of high school athletes, um, high school student athletes, and they asked them, like, what's the worst part about high school athletics? Like, what's the worst part about sports for you? And, like, by far the number one answer was the ride home, you know, because their parents were so critical. You know, like, how come you didn't do this? How come, you know, da da da, da. And um, it's really common. And I know for me, too, I, like, I feel the temptation, not necessarily to be critical in a mean way, but just, like, offer, you know, <laughs> offer, like, coaching. Because, like, oh, I noticed this and whatever. But, like, the discipline that's required of us just, like, to, you know, hold off. You know, but I just bring that up because it's, like, I know it's like a non-Christian kind of uh, coaching alliance saying they're just talking about being positive and so on. But this is what our new life in Christ looks like. You know, it's, it's not just um, like we're going to be willing to have this bad relationship with our kids, like as if our relationship is not part of like the unity of the church. It's not part of the love that we live in together. Like we're called to be one. You know, and parents, yeah, kids in that, especially in that culture, they're just sort of unimportant. You know, they're just kind of there. But no, they are part, and they're in this church as they're listening to Paul's letter. We're all part of this body together. You know, education of children was a big deal to them, just like it is to us in our world. You know, like with our kids, like with you guys, when you, I don't know, some of you guys maybe 20 years ago or 10 years ago, five years ago, like now, Education of children is a big deal. You know, you go to school. You go to Kumon. Some of you guys go to Kumon or went to Kumon. I'm so sorry. We, <laughs> like, we'll do a ministry time later. Like, everyone who can't, went to Kumon, come to the front. We'll pray for you. You know, but um, uh, like music lessons, travel sports teams. You know, like, man, watching that video. Even in Indonesia, Lynn is teaching AP calculus. Like, what? <laughs> like, halfway across the world. You know, like, man, you cannot escape it. But, like, Paul is, is, is telling the church, don't just be confer, con, concerned with overall education like everyone else is, like the rest of our culture is, with education in the Lord. That's our primary thing, growing together in the Lord. Amen? Okay. Um, oh, by the way, remember that adult children are part of this, too. You know, there are multiple generations in this church. And definitely in that culture, for sure, like Jewish or Roman, honoring parents does not stop at adulthood. That's part of our life together. Show me what submission and love in the Lord looks like through how you treat your parents, even if you're 30, even if you're 40. Amen? Okay. Last thing, slaves and lords, chapter 6, 5 to 9. Uh, just, again, we'll start with a question. Does this passage condone slavery, the institution of slavery? No. I'll just say that. No. It doesn't condone slavery. yes. I don't, I don't, we can't say that it's a manifesto on ending slavery. It's not an abolitionist document. But if we understand Roman era slavery and how it works, I think we can see how subversive and, subversive and how fundamentally challenging to slavery Paul is being in this letter and in this church life. I'm just going to read verse 5 to 9 again. Bond servants, slaves, obey your lords, your earthly lords, with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Remember that slaves are in this audience. They're part of the church. Remember what Paul has said about the whole church. Every joint, every part of the body matters. All of us are one. All of us are part of this temple, this body of the Lord. Slaves too. Verse 6, not by the way of, of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will to the Lord, not to man knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Lords, do the same to them and stop threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours, their Lord and yours, is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. Slavery, like I said, was very common. It's like 10 to 30 percent of the population is slaves. Like, the economy is based on the institution of slavery of that time. You know, kind of like the American South. Um, you know, pre-Civil War. Slavery is a big part of life. But the thing was, 
slavery in the end wasn't just about like what job you do, because slaves and non-slaves did the same jobs back then, okay? Like they lived in the same places and so on. What was really different between slaves and non-slaves in that time and in that culture it was the difference in like worth and equality or even humanity, okay? Like in a world, a Roman world that was all about honor, they had no honor. They were viewed as tools rather than as people. And so that's why in that time, you can, and it's totally culturally acceptable, you can abuse slaves. You can beat them. You can beat them badly. You can threaten them. Physical threats of violence, actually done and just threatened. That was just part of life with slaves back then. You could sexually abuse them. That was just part of life with slaves back then because they're just tools. We just use them. They're less than human. They're, they're, they're less than the rest of us. So that's the mentality of slavery. That's what underlies slavery in the Roman world, this, this lack of honor, this lack of worth. And so we come to this part of Paul, and we think about the way that Paul is talking to slaves with their lords present in this book, in this letter. You are all one in Christ. All parts of our body matter. Every part does its work. We're joined together in love, and we want power from the Holy Spirit to understand, to somehow comprehend this incomprehensible love. And we want to experience this together, to know the height and width and depth and breadth of Christ's love together. He's saying that to slaves and owners together. Slaves alongside non-slaves are listening to Paul. They're hearing that there's no difference in worth and honor between these two groups of people. No difference in importance. No difference in our oneness with Christ. And what they're hearing is radical. That, and in verse 9, it, this is amazing. He says, lords or owners, do the same to them. Do the same to them. Like serve them. Be a slave to your slaves. That's the extent. Like, do the same things to them. I mean, that's craziness. Owners, be slaves to your slaves in Christ. Not because it makes economic sense, but because it makes spiritual sense. This is who we are in Christ. We're one in Christ. And he says, stop your threatening. This is the old life. This is before Christ. If you had slaves, you could just threaten. You could physically abuse. You could sexually abuse. You could do this. And I bet some of these slaves in the church were people who had been abused in multiple kinds of ways. They're the people listening to this. And Paul says to the owners in their hearing, do not threaten anymore. That's part of an old relationship. That's part of an old life outside of Christ. But now in Christ, we have a better way, a way of oneness, a way of unity, a way of love, of self-sacrifice. And he says in verse 9, stop your threatening because you know that you and they have the same Lord. Because you know that you and they are both slaves of Christ. And Paul says that about himself often. He says, I'm a slave of Christ a servant of Christ, depending on translation. And there's no partiality with our Lord. There's no partiality with our Lord. Lords, submit to your slaves. We're all doing this out of reverence for Christ. Lords, love sacrificially your slaves. Parents, love sacrificially your kids. Kids, submit to your parents. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, oh my gosh, and let me just think, oh, this is Christ in the church. You know, Genesis 2, that's about Christ in the church. We're all so one. Show us this. This is what Paul is saying in this section. Just the last thing I'm going to say the church has a terrible history with many of these things that we just read. The church has a terrible history with many of the things that we just read in terms of spousal relations, especially with abuse domestically. It has a terrible history with slavery. 
and I mean, we could talk for hours and days about this. But another side of that coin, too, though, is that the church has a great history with this, too. The church has a great history with these things. Just thinking about slavery. I mean, there's a person that's later talked about in the Bible in the letter of Philemon, Onesimus. He's a slave, former slave. Paul says to his former lord or owner, like, set him free. Make him freed. Because he's a brother in Christ. This Onesimus, tradition has it, became the bishop in Ephesus, actually. This church that uh, received this letter from Paul. In the 1800s, the abolitionist movement in America and in England. I mean, it wasn't all by Christians, but man, Christians were the engine in that movement. I mean, the church has a great history with this too. To the Lord, like the Lord, in the Lord. This is how we live. This is our new life in Christ together, in our households, with our children, with each other, with our spouses. With, I know we don't have slaves and owners, but you know, if we did, our relationships are so different, primarily because they're now to the Lord, in the Lord, like the Lord. Just as, a, you know, just as we kind of take this whole passage, as we take this letter in, I just want to encourage us, you know, Lord, just to say, Lord, I'm thankful for our new life in Christ. It's a better way. It's a more beautiful way. It's a way that Christ, you showed us. It's the way that Christ, you teach us and the way you treat us, Lord. And I want to treat others like that, too. We want to treat each other like that. We want to know the love and the image of God like this together. So please pray with me um, just, just for a moment here. Um, let's just, just in your own way, just going to ask first, just in your own way, just commit to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to commit, like, in my relationships, especially my relationship with other Christians, maybe in my family too, Lord, we want to live like Christ, in Christ, like unto Christ. That's how we want to live. And just say, I mean, it's just a simple prayer, but just say, Lord, I, we commit ourselves to living like this. Just take a moment to say that. And then take another moment, and in as much as we can honestly recognize in us and maybe in our, our larger church, not just GCCC, but our larger church, Big C Church, how we choose old clothes instead of new clothes. And we choose domination and power. You know, even at the expense of unity and relationship. And just let's confess that together. We're part of the church. It's not just, oh, that person's sin or their sin. It's, it's our sin. It's, we're all one body. And just confess that to the Lord. Just say, we're sorry about this. Just in your own way, just take a moment. Finally, just, just for a moment again, we just be thankful to the Lord. Sing songs to one another, making melody in our hearts, giving thanks for everything in Christ. Living out this life because we're thankful. Living out this life because it's beautiful and good. Living out this life because that's really what we've experienced. Forgiveness and love and submission reverence. That's what we've experienced in Christ. Just thank the Lord for this. Just for a moment, using your own words. Um, 
Rebecca is going to lead us in a corporate prayer together, but I'm um, just going to pray for us um, just before she does. Lord, we're thankful. And Lord, we're trusting that you're filling us with your spirit even as we're together like this, as we're setting our minds and as we're setting our will and our hearts on, on thankfulness, on love, on submission. Lord, on just oneness in Christ as we set ourselves as we set our wills on it, Lord, we trust that we're being filled by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for your flowing Holy Spirit even now. Lord, as we continue to pray, Lord, be delighted in us and let us find our delight in you, Lord. Um, let us continue to pray together. Um, on the night that Jesus died, before taking upon himself the sins of the world, he went to pray at a place called Gethsemane. There he cried out to his heavenly father, expressing his troubled heart, knowing what following his father's will would mean. He would be physically harmed, he would experience humiliation, and worst of all, he would experience separation from God his father. Yet he prayed with submission to God. He prayed not for his own will, but for the Father's will to be done, knowing that what God willed for him would bring about the salvation of the world. As we pray corporately now, I am going to say, Lord, we draw near with true hearts and a full assurance of faith. Um, and when I say this, please respond by saying, not what we will, but what you will. Lord, we draw near with true hearts and a full assurance of faith. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and confess that many times we want to have the final say about what happens in our lives. Trusting you is difficult. Many times we believe we know what is best for us, what will give us the most peace, joy, purpose, fulfillment, wholeness, life. We often forget that you are the author of life, that all things are created through you and for you. We, like all things in this world, find our reason for being in you. Lord, be honored as we surrender and submit to your will. Lord, we draw near with true hearts and a full assurance of faith. Lord, we confess our sin. We confess that we selectively love others. Many times we choose to love those who are the easiest to love those who love us in return, those who offer us something in return, those who are similar to us, those who we don't have to give much to, those who don't cost us much. Forgive us for turning a blind eye to those who are harder to love, especially people who are the most vulnerable, those who have no voice. Lord, we are putting on a life of loving others like you do, with no strings attached, without condemnation, without preference. We are putting on a life of forgiving others as you forgave us. We are putting on a life of giving of ourselves as you gave of yourself. Lord, we draw near with true hearts and a full assurance of faith. Lord, we desire that our local church body in Tyson's and here in Arlington is part of bringing your kingdom here. We submit our hopes and dreams for what this church looks like. Our church size, we submit to you. Our church finances, we submit to you. Our church mission, we submit to you. As you've led us to love and care for the refugee and immigrant, immigrant populations in Bailey's Crossroads, we submit what our work will ultimately look like to you. 
as you've led us to partner with Little Lights, Casa Chirilagua, Global Gates, and international workers in Cambodia, Indonesia, and Tea House, we submit those partnerships to you. We recognize our inclination to look inwards and care for ourselves first and sometimes only. Forgive us. If you are calling us to give more of ourselves, to partner in other real and tangible ways, help us submit to your will. Lord, we draw near with true hearts and a full assurance of faith. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Lord, fill us with your promised Holy Spirit. In your son's name, we pray all of this. Amen. You know, as we, as we pray those prayers and as we, you know, think about our life together uh, as a church, I'm just struck again with just, like, how good our life is and how beautiful. Sometimes challenging, but it's, it's just a really beautiful life we have together. Um, as we take communion, um, let's celebrate that beauty, you know, that we're all, we're all belonging to this. We're all part of this. And by eating this bread and drinking this cup, we're identifying with Christ. Christ, your life is ours. Your love is ours. The life that you showed us, the life that you gave to us, is the life that we live together. That's what we're doing as we take this, uh, take these elements together. Because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. He took the cup and he said, this is the blood of a new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins and when you take this bread when you take this cup you proclaim my death until uh, i come again this is what we do we are celebrating our oneness with christ our life together in christ just as his body was broken we eat of it and we're part of that life with him uh, it's a beautiful life it's a great life um let's come up uh actually we're going to say this creed right before we came up come up it's just a summary of our our faith and right after we do that, I invite you to come. We'll, we'll sing a couple songs to close. Um, but you can take uh, each element, bring it to your, uh, bring it back to where you're sitting, and let's be thankful uh, for this life in Christ. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. follower of Christ, we invite you to come and, and take these elements. The riches of this world will fade. The treasures of our God
as we go from here, we're always sent. Um, we're always sent to others, and um, it's really a cool thing to be able to send you guys out, like send us out every week. Um, today, with Pastor Steve joining us, we wanted to have Steve uh, send us out. Um, Steve, if you don't know, he's our like lead pastor over all GCC. He's usually at Tyson, so it's great to have him here today. But um, Steve, will send us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for reminding us of the beautiful life that we have in you. Lord, help us to put off things that are not of you. We confess how weak we are often in putting off our old self, but we trust in you, God, that you would do this. We thank you Thank you that we are one and, and that we are people of the Holy Spirit. As we leave this place, we pray for filling and empowerment and leading of your spirit for us as we continue to live out the call that you have for us now may the love of god the father and the grace of our lord jesus christ and the fellowship of the holy spirit be upon you god's people as we leave to bless others amen 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 thanks so much for coming today thank you